Good morning, everybody. Um, as Jürgen just said, I'm, I'm Sue Bon. I'm presently at the, 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 uh, the, the Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital. Until just over a year ago, I worked for quite a long time at the Great North Children's Hospital in Newcastle, where I had a very close link to both the allergy and the immunology team. Um, We've got quite a mixed audience today, and so I'm told. So we've got a sort of mix of dietitians, primary care, primary health um, nurses, consultants, registrars from paediatrics. So it's been a slightly tricky decision about how I was going to cover this sort of immense area and actually make it useful, hopefully, to everybody. Um, so after some thought, what I thought I'd do to start off with is to look at reactions to food generally and, and the suggestion that actually they're not all allergic um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to look at the non-IgE mediated allergy syndromes because there's lots of different ones and then I'm going to look at how those fit into what we call the IMAP guidelines. it's the International Milk Allergy and Primary Care. I've put those in your handouts, I hope you've got those um, because what I'm going to do is not go into them in great detail but signpost important bits through them um, because, I, because I've given those, but they are immensely helpful and I think they are actually immensely helpful not just in primary <coughs> care but actually in secondary care as well. I've got a couple of cases just to hopefully look at the, the diversity of non-IgE mediated allergies that we see. Um, and I'm just going to touch at the end on eosinophilic esophagitis. So as a paediatric gastroenterologist, that's one of the allergies you really need me for. Um, and it's also something that we tend to miss and we, and we pick up very, very late and there are knock-on complications when we miss it. So I'm going to talk about that and I'll finish with some take-home messages. I have apologised to you because I thought I had 40 minutes and not 30 minutes. So what I'll do is I'll skip through a few slides as I go through and try and keep to time. So if we talk initially about reactions to food, we're all here to talk about allergy. So food allergies are adverse immunological reactions to a specific food. And over the course of the day, we'll talk about different kinds of food allergies. We've got IgE, non-IgE, and some that we're, sort of, we're not really quite sure, like eosinophilic esophagitis, which we're calling mixed IgE and non-IgE. The difficult one in many ways is the non-IgE because we don't have any tests. And therefore we say it's you suspect it, you take the food out, they get better, you put the food back in, they get worse again. And that's sort of the basis of our diagnosis. However, there are other reactions to foods where you take it out, they get better, you put it back in, they get worse again, which are not allergy. So it's worthwhile as all knowing about those and thinking about them. So I've split the reactions into food, into or at least the non-allergic ones, into intolerances um, and what I term the red herrings, and I'll come to that in more detail. So in terms of the intolerances, it could be you're only ever allergic to protein. There are other things in your food apart from protein, and you could be maldigesting those. So if you maldigested a sugar, so we can only absorb sugars when they're monosaccharides, and if we had a, a sugar that was not digested into monosaccharides and it went through the small bowel undigested, it hit the colon, it gets fermented by the clonic bacteria, that produces flatus, it changes the pH of the stool, it stops the water being absorbed. So the symptoms of a carbohydrate malabsorption are abdominal pain due to flatus, marked diarrhea, often explosive diarrhea being passed with flatus, acidic stools and a, a very sore acid burnt perineum. So if you take lactose, for example, and you don't have enough lactase to split the lactose into glucose and galactose, you will get those symptoms. If you take the entire milk out, those symptoms will go away. You put the entire milk back in again, they will come back again, but it's not a food allergy. So the, the way you would pick that up in clinical practice would be the families would say, oh, actually they're fine on mature cheese, which is naturally low in lactose, but actually they struggle with milk or yogurt. So you have to take a very detailed history to try and pick out which bit of the food it is that they're reacting to. You can have a reaction to chemicals in food, such as histamine or tyramine, and there's also got things like food additives. So I look after children with oral facial granulomatosis, and we know that taking cinnamon and benzoate out of the diet makes their oral disease much, much better. So that's a reaction to food, but it's not technically really a food allergy. The difficult ones, and I think these tie in very closely to what Daniel's going to say to you this afternoon, would be um, the aggravation of visceral hypersensitivity. And what I mean by that is, in children with irritable bowel syndrome, there are foods which aggravate their symptoms. So what I tend to say to families is, if I had heartburn and I ate 
um, curry or I had orange juice, that acid would aggravate my symptoms. It's not causing the symptoms, it's aggravating the symptoms. And when you've got irritable bowel syndrome, there are some foods which aggravate your symptoms. If you want to look more details on that, you can go online and look for a FODMAP diet, F-O-D-M-A-P, and they give you a list of the foods that can aggravate irritable bowel syndrome. But classically, onion and garlic can be very common. So again, you'll have patients coming to clinic saying, when I have onion and garlic, dreadful abdominal pain, diarrhea. When I take them out, they get better. When I put them back in again, they come back again. But that's not a non-IgE mediated food allergy. And then getting to the more, even more tricky bit um, is the psychological difficulties. And this is something that I deal a lot with, my allergy colleagues deal a lot with. And what we spend a lot, a lot of time in my clinic talking to families about is the very close link between the brain and the gut. And essentially, if you expect a food to cause a symptom, it will cause a symptom. So if there's so much anxiety around that food, when you're given it, you will get nausea, you will get abdominal pain, you will get vomiting. And so the family will be absolutely convinced and the child absolutely convinced that that food is causing the problem. But actually it can be psychological rather than allergic. And when we get very difficult families who've serially taken out lots and lots of foods, the way of dissecting that is partly a very close history because they should be reacting to the food protein in every single form, or at least every unbaked form, if, it's a true food allergy. But really, if we get very stuck, we bring them in for what we call a double blind food challenge. And that's where we get a very expert dietitian to we say, let's say it's egg. And, we'll, and they will make food A, food B, and food C. They have food A for two days, food B for two days, food C for two days. Now, in one of those foods, the protein is hidden, but the family don't know where it is, the child doesn't know where it is, the nursing staff don't, the medical staff don't, and we keep a really careful symptom diary, and at the end of that process, we unblind the family. And usually, I would say, Michelle and Louise, when we do that on the ward, the symptoms they were identifying were not anything to do clearly with, with the days when the child actually got the protein. And it was all about the anxiety, not, not about the, the actual food protein. So skipping on to non-IG mediated food allergies, I, I tended to say to my allergy colleagues in Newcastle that they had it easy. When they did dealt with IgE mediated allergies, the, the reactions were quick, they were obvious and they had tests, both skin prick tests and blood tests, which show them what foods they're allergic to. With the non ige mediated allergies, it's very, di it's very different. It could be two to four hours after the ingestion that these symptoms come on. I've got no tests at all that would reliably tell me which food it is. We don't fully understand the pathophysiology and we don't know f in all the different cases what the future holds for these children. So the only way you can make a non-IgE mediated food allergy is to keep it in your mind and to consider it. Then you take an allergy focus history. And so you're looking for red flags and we'll talk about that later. They respond to an elimination diet and they get a reoccurrence of the symptoms when you, when you reintroduce that food. The ways that non-IgE mediated food allergy can present are absolutely diverse, you name it pediatric gastrointestinal symptom, it can present, food allergy can present with it really. The ones in the list I wanted to draw your attention to were food aversion and refusal. I think that is a really, really common allergic symptom in children um, and infants, um, non-IgE, but also eosinophilic esophagitis, you must think about it. Um, certainly health visitors in the audience, you, you find families where the baby is fussing and fussing and eventually they're just dream feeding. So that is the only time they'll take the bottle is when they're sort of nodding off to sleep. These are really big clues that there might be an allergic component to their problem. I think this is something we should ask about. So with the non-IgE mediated dysmotility that we see, the child often will not open their bowels for several days and they'll strain and strain and strain, but when they do pass, it's quite soft. And that again is another clue that maybe we're dealing with allergy. But as well as not missing allergy, I'm very keen that we don't overdiagnose. So infant colic is normal. So if you have a child that's fussing and fretting and screaming for one, two, three hours in the evening, that is normal. And we should not be trying to manage that either medically or dietetically. Likewise, um, reflux. So we, whenever I 
try and teach about reflux, I try and define what is gastrophageal reflux, which is normal, or gastrophageal reflux disease. And when I teach medical students and junior doctors, I tend to pull this picture up, which is me with my middle child. Um, and I show it because there is not a picture of you in the first six months of life, but we don't have a towel so, so somewhere in the picture. And this baby vomited gushes of vomit three, four times a day all the way through his sort of first four to six months. And I show it to medical students and I show it to junior doctors and I say, this is an anxious middle-class mother who's breastfeeding. This is her child. He vomits gushes of sick three, four times a day. What do you want to do about it? And invariably we go from <laughs> mixing Gaviscon with a bit of breast milk, um, put him on ranitidine, put him on omeprazole, take him off the breasts, put him on a cow's milk free diet. And obviously the right answer is absolutely nothing. Look. <laughs> He's fine. He's a robust, healthy boy. Um, and actually, if you treat him, you're not treating him, you're treating his parents. And we need to try not to over-medicalize children like this. So we talk about gastrophageal reflux disease as being children who have a complication of that regurgitation or vomiting, be it um, iron deficiency anemia, screaming and unsettled outside that just few hours in the evening, fail to thrive, those kind of things. So when we look at the allergic gut disorders, we do have some IgE-mediated reactions, which I'm not speaking about, but there are different kinds of non-IgE-mediated reactions. So if I take you through them, we've got food protein-induced dysmotility. We'll talk about that in more details. When the dysmotility affects mostly the top part of the gut, it tends to cause food refusal, fussing at the bottle and, 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 and regurgitation. When it's at the bottom part of the bowel, you often have this soft stool constipation, or you can have both. There's something called food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome or FPIES. Um, and this is where the, the child would have a sort of profound shock like collapse with vomiting and diarrhea, often with blood with the diarrhea when they're given the offending protein. We've got a food protein induced enteropathy. This is much rarer. We see it, we'll come in a moment, you see it in the older children, but it, it's where the food protein causes such an inflammation of the lining of the bowel that we lose the little microscopic fingers, the villi. So then they have a flat mucosa, they, they malabsorb profoundly. They often get a protein losing enteropathy. They're very, very sick. And then we've got food protein induced proctitis or proctocolitis, which is probably the more, one of the more common ones where we just see children with, with bloody stools. When you're considering non-IgE mediated allergies, different kinds of allergies present at different ages. And even with the same allergy, the symptoms are different at different ages. So um, this thing we talk about eosinophilic esophagitis, the same condition has different symptoms at different ages. So if I were to biopsy this one-year-old who's got a feeding disorder, and I biopsy this 16-year-old who's got food impaction, the histological features are the same, but the symptoms are completely different. And we tend not to miss these, or at least we're getting better at not missing them here, but we miss these ones. So if I split these into now, the four different conditions that we've just talked about, proctocolitis, dysmotility, FIs, and the enteropathy. I've put on this slide when, you when it tends to present and when, it ten when the children tend to grow out of it. Um, and then we'll take you through each of those in, in sequence, just, just briefly. So if we talk about FPIs, this is the typical, sorry, FPIs, we talk about the food protein induced proctitis and proctocolitis. This is the kind of nappy that you would see. I'm sure most people in the audience have probably seen it. They usually presents within the first months of life and they've got a mucousy bloody stool. Differential diagnosis for the paediatricians among us. When they come in, I have to say, I always insist that everybody checks the clotting because I always worry that we're going to miss a hemorrhagic disease of the newborn at some point in a breastfed baby. I've never, ever seen it. And in primary care, I don't think that's important. But I have to say, if they come to me, I would tend to do a clotting to look for that. And then in hospital, necrotizing enterocolitis and occasionally gastroenteritis. So this is an inflammatory response that's limited just to the distal sigmoid and colon, more than 50% of breastfed babies. Um, it generally presents in less than two months and they're usually thriving well, happy, content babies and just the only abnormality is this, this bloody mucousy stool. It's usually cow's milk protein. And the diagnosis is based on rec recognizing it in response to symptoms and it can be done in primary care and it's part of the IMAP guidelines, which I'm gonna come on to. The, if you're gonna Take the breastfed infants, mum gets taken off breast milk, you supplement her with calcium and vitamin D. 
if the, and then the great thing about this, which I'm going to come to in a minute, is it should be better within three to four days. You know, it's that quick, it gets better. So if it hasn't got better in three to four days, then you can take out soya, then you could take out egg. If it's not got better three days after that, then you're really questioning is, have we got a diagnosis right? And it should be referred through to a gastroenterologist. Um, in formula fed babies, most will get better on extensively hydrolyzed. Very occasionally, you need to use an AA formula. So you can reintroduce by six, month, by, by six months in 50% of breastfed babies and nine, nine months in 95. It's almost always better in the first year of life. Okay, so food allergy-related dysmotility and gastrophageal reflux. Obviously, differential diagnosis we've already talked about. So when you look at the literature about how many children with gastrophageal reflux is it allergy-related, the figures vary hugely from four or five percent to almost 50 percent. But I think that when you look through those papers carefully, some of them are looking at gastrophageal reflux disease and some of them are looking at gastrophageal reflux. And when you look at gastrophageal reflux disease, it's probably more like the 40 to 50 percent. So the kids we should be treating, an awful lot of them will have a cow's milk protein allergy. Um, and the dysmotility part of it is because the immune process doesn't work just on the mucosa, it works on the, the, the nervous system within the gut. So just to show you a little bit of sort of gastroenterology science, um, people don't realize that we have a pacemaker in our stomach just the same as we have a pacemaker in our heart. So you measure the, the, the pacemaker in your heart with an ECG, you measure the pacemaker in the stomach with an electrogastrogram, an EGG. And the normal pattern on feeding is this one. So we have the, the stomach squeezes at three, three times per minute. And when you feed, the, the, um, the strength of those squeezing motions gradually builds up over the first sort of half an hour or so. If you feed in cow's milk, so you've got a cow's milk allergic baby that you give cow's milk to, this is the pattern. So it starts squeezing extremely hard very quickly. Um, it's very disorganized. And actually you can see that the, it, you have a, a, a bradyarrhythmia, so it goes much slower. So it's squeezing at once a minute or twice a minute. That's the dysmotility you're inducing by giving a cow's milk allergic baby cow's milk. And likewise, if we look at the emptying time of the stomach, if you give a cow's milk allergic baby cow's milk, that milk is still at least half it sat in the stomach an hour and a half later. Whereas in normal children, half would have left in sort of round about an hour or so. So it sits in the stomach for an awful lot longer. So if we come to the IMAP guidelines. Um, when we do, the, they're extremely useful, as I say, but they, they divide the non-IgE mediated allergies into mild to moderate, um, and severe. And then you have to try and think where these fit in. It's not completely clear, and it is a bit sort of open to interpretation where they fit into that. Generally, I would say that these two, the proctocolitis and the dysmotility, fit into the mild um, pathway. And generally, and maybe occasionally, if you had a really bad one, they might fit into this pathway. And generally, the enteropathy would fit into the severe. The FPIs, they do mention it in the guidelines that that fits into the severe, but I, I'd be surprised if that presents in primary care. That generally would come whooshing into A&E and we'd pick that up in, in, in secondary care. But if you were seeing the, the, the CLAP enteritis syndrome, then that would fit into the severe. But however, a very mild enteropathy might fit into the mild pathway, so it's, it's difficult to call it. So I'll put in your hand over, um, or your hand out, um, the, the two, the, the, the sheets, and it divides, as I say, mild to moderate non ig mediated cow's milk allergy and severe. It gives you the kind of symptoms that you would be looking for. It highlights useful things like, particularly in treatment failures of atopic dermatitis or reflux, think about allergy. So it, it highlights nice useful things like that. It tries to tell you which ones are more severe. It talks very much about doing an allergy-focused history. So I've already mentioned this, but there's a sheet, I think, I hope in your hand over that, that I sent through um, that, and if not, we, we can get it sorted out for you, um, that tells you what kind of questions you should be asking to try and work out whether the, this child's symptoms could be allergy-related. And then it gives you a plan for what you do about it. So this is the, the plan. So this is mild, non-IgE. This is if they're formula feeding or mixed feeding. It tells that you, you what you should do. And essentially, it is using an extensively hydrolyzed formula. You use it for two to four weeks, and then you decide, is there a clear improvement or is there no clear improvement? If there's no clear improvement and you still really think it's an allergy, try an amino acid-based formula. 
If there's a, a, a definite improvement, it's very clear and it's supported by the nice, nice quality standards. We should, and I'm not sure we all do this, we should be doing a challenge. So we should, and, and there's guidelines within the IMAP about how you do that and how much milk you give them. So you try that baby back on milk again in one form of the, or mom back on milk again, and you see, do the symptoms come back? And only if they come back on the milk can you say this is an allergy. Because there is quite, quite a high proportion that when you put them back on milk, and it doesn't come back. So again, it was a red herring. They just got incidentally better when we put them on the cow's milk-free diet. There's the same pathway for the breastfed children. And then there's a, a pathway really for the severe non-IgE mediated allergy. Again, this is aimed at primary care, really saying recognize it, get them onto an amino acid based formula and get them referred up to a specialist. They say in the guidelines, a, a specialist pediatric allergist, but it could be a pediatrician with an allergy interest, or it could be a gastroenterology with an allergy interest, but you need to get them seen in, in, in secondary or tertiary care. I'll just spend a little bit of time with this because I think this is, can you see it? Yeah, because it's really, really helpful. And so now things have changed. When, when I started doing this, we just put everybody, we'd keep them on a cow's milk free diet till six, till, till 12 months, and then we'd start reintroducing the home environment. There is a different guideline now which says if that child has got severe atopic dermatitis or they've got anything in the history, you see them at that state, anything in the history that suggests an IgE mediated allergy, we should be getting skin prick testing or specific IgE testing because there have been case reports of children having anaphylactic reactions, even when we thought it was non-IgE previously. So we should be getting that done. If they're negative, we can start reintroducing milk by the milk ladder. If they've never had those symptoms, we can start introducing milk by the milk ladder in primary care. If they're positive, they need to come to an allergist. Or if there's a history and we're, and we're, not, and we're still not, either they're negative and we're not sure, or they're positive, they should come through to an allergist. So that is different to a lot of us, what a lot of us have been doing. I think, again, I, you should have this in your, in your handover. We've got a milk ladder, which is where we try and increase, we try and put milk in, um, in the cooked form first, because at the mild end of the spectrum, children can <coughs> tolerate cooked milk and they work their way up this ladder. Um, and if they have symptoms, no symptoms on pancake, but they have symptoms on cheese, then you say, that's great. You can have the cookie biscuit muffin pancake, keep that cooked milk going in their diet because that's very important to try and build tolerance for those children. Um, a lot of children, what we used to do is we'd say, oh, just have some milk and they would have nasty symptoms. So we'd take it out again for six months and then they'd end up being restricted for a much longer period. So the guidance very much now is that we should, once we're happy, they've been six months on the diet um, and they're over 12 months of, of age um, and we're happy that there's not a, an IgE mediated component, then we should be trying to introduce. There's no doubt that some children have symptoms at this kind of level, but we should try and work our way up. So that needs to be supported by, by a dietitian, certainly in hospital. So the problems I would identify and we can talk about it at the end if there's any more anybody else comes up with of looking after these children. The first would be that you want to put the child onto an extensively hydrolyzed formula. Um, they look different and they taste different. Under the age of about three to four months, babies shouldn't really notice, but certainly once they get older than that, they, they really do notice. So again, in the IMAP guidelines, there's some really helpful advice on how you can get them to take it. And essentially it's mixing a little bit with their standard formula and then building it up slowly to try and get them to, to accept the taste. Um, a lot of the new extensively hydrolyzed formulas are better tasting, I think, actually, than they had been in the past. So we don't see this refusal to take extensively hydrolyzed formulas so much. I should say that you should never use soy milk under the age of six months. And my advice would be to try and avoid it until over the age of 12 months as well. Um, that's not to say I don't break that rule very, very occasionally if I really can't get the babies to take anything else. Over the age of 12 months, there are other milk substitutes that you can use, but you shouldn't use rice milk under the age of five because of the, the cyanide content. So, um, so that, that's what we talk about. That. Again, there is some information in there. We certainly see a child that responds to extensively hydrolyzed formula, the symptoms get better, and then down the line, a week down the line, three weeks line down, a month down the line, suddenly they're all creeping back again. And then people say, oh, well, it can't be an allergy. I think what I would do under those circumstances always is consider that they might have sensitized to the hydrolyzed protein. So what you do then is actually switch them onto an amino acid based formula. 
I guess one of the biggest problems we see, probably at least in secondary and tertiary care, is these the families that are taking out sequential food proteins. Um, and that's very different, uh, difficult. You're all aware that there's lots of stuff out there about taking hair samples or waving sticks over babies and all sorts of things that will diagnose food allergies. And the families go and do that. Um, you know, I come to clinic, they come to clinic sometimes with a computer printout of <coughs> tens of foods that they've been told that their baby is allergic to or their child is allergic to and they're desperately trying to take out the diet. So, you know, with the non-IgE immediate allergies, there is no test at all that, that will actually tell us what, what, what the child is allergic to. So the families need to be educated on that. We need to talk a lot about taking very careful history and seeing if they, if they say they are reacting to legumes is it all forms of legumes if they're reacting to milk is it is it all forms of milk because often you'll find that they can have some and not have other forms of it which can points that it isn't really allergy so a lot of our job is to try and take that out. the other thing they do quite a lot is i say it's adding two and two and making six so it'll be little johnny had a really difficult night on tuesday night on monday evening he'd eaten a tomato based sauce oh it must be tomato so that gets taken <coughs> out and then he gets this really difficult night a few nights later well on, on on the thursday evening he'd eat an x oh we'll take that out as well and so the families come to, they're desperately trying to do something but they're, they're making the wrong decisions and taking foods out and we need to try and support them into putting the foods back in again and not taking any more out so if we talk a little bit about some cases um we have um this is a little girl I, I saw when I was actually in Newcastle. So this is Honey. She was the first child of an older mother. Um, she was, mum failed at breastfeeding and changed to cow and gate first at two weeks. The little one had some screaming, back arching and regurgitation and the health officer took an allergy related history and decided it was a cow's milk allergy and very appropriately put her onto Nutramagen and the symptoms resolved entirely. However, she started a cow's milk free weaning diet at five months but symptoms came um, and in primary care they thought actually maybe this was soya quite appropriately and soy was taken out as well. So soy was then reintroduced successfully at 12 months and, reintroduced, and milk reintroduced successfully at 13 months and then she remained completely well um, until she was 23 months of age when she developed to gastroenteritis. That gastroenteritis got better in five days but subsequently she had some sort of mild constipation, but more than anything, just misery. She was very poor sleeping, crying overnight, pulling her knees up, sort of passing flaters overnight. And mum was convinced that she had an awful lot of abdominal pain. There was no improvement in this sort of constipation with the Movacol. And when she was two and a half years old, she demanded referral to a paediatric gastroenterology service. When I took the history, there was definitely red flags for food allergy. There was a family history of ATP. She got a previous history of non-IG mediated food allergy. There's a worsening of symptoms after gastroenteritis, and I think we do see that. So when you get mucosal inflammation, they can resensitize again. So I think that was, there's a change in stools. Um, and I'll come to this in a second. When people ask me, how do you know of all the hundreds of kids we see with constipation, which ones might be a food allergy? What I'll tend to say is it's when you get funny constipation and when they don't respond to the medication in the way you would expect them to. So if you put one sachet of Movacol in and then you put two in and you put three in, you would expect a sequential change in that child's stools. And in these kind of children, it doesn't, they always say they can't find a rhyme or reason. It just seems to be you can put loads in or you can put one, oops, or you can put one in, and nothing seems to work quite the way as it should do. They have a strange response. And obviously this little girl had no response to Movacol, which was a bit of a clue to me as well. And I think this sort of misery, poor sleeping, nocturnal symptoms are very classical of a non-IGE mediated food allergy as well. So what I did is I took milk and soy out of her diet. She did improve slowly and she got about 80% better. I often use sodium chromoglycate if I think there's just some mild symptoms of non-IgE mediated food allergy, which is a mast cell stabilizer. And I was always trained that you had a 50-50 chance of it working. And I would say it's probably even slightly better than that. But if it works, it can work really nicely just to take the edge off the remaining symptoms. Um, and when she had accidental exposure to milk, she had a reoccurrence of symptoms. How am I doing time-wise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So we'll skip that one. So I'll just talk a little bit about F-PIES. Um, 
because it's worth you being aware of it. So I'll give you a case just, and this would be a very typical case. So Fergus, again, was a little boy I looked after in Newcastle. He presented at six months of age. Um, he was exclusively breastfed until five months. His mother had hay fever and eczema, and his older brother, Randall, had um, milk and soya, non-IgE mediated allergy, which resolved and he got back onto all foods by two years. He had had three episodes after he'd been weaned of going floppy, pale, profuse diarrhea and vomiting, and mum had called 999 on two occasions and taken him in to A&E. Um, I'm very fond of this mum, and on the third occasion she didn't, because she said they didn't do anything there, they just sort of watched him and put all these monitors in and then he just gradually got better. So on the third occasion she didn't call, in. She didn't call the ambulance, she kept him at home. But he did attend, he did attend A&E on two occasions. On the first occasion, he'd just about an hour previously had some baby rice, but she'd mix it with formula milk. On the second occasion, she'd, he'd had a Farley's rusk, but she'd mixed it, mixed it with her breast milk. So we have to think what could possibly be causing this. Um, when I looked at the ingredients of the, um, the Farley's rusks, we had milk and soya, but we also had rice. So to my mind, this could be a milk F pies or it could be a rice F pies, but it sounded very much like a F pies. The third occasion, mum decided to try the rusk at home again, just to make sure. And that's, that's what happened <laughs> the third time at home. So what we did, we brought him in for an F pies challenge. An F pies challenge is an inpatient food challenge. You must not challenge children with query F pies at home. They get a cannula. Um, we, and we make sure it's during the daytime when there's staff available to resuscitate them if necessary. And the dietitians again, are immensely helpful. You have to give enough protein to induce the f pies reaction. And therefore, it's, it involves specialist dietetic import to make sure they get enough of that protein in. And Fergus passed his milk challenge and failed his rice challenge, which I was secretly pleased about because my dietitian predicted it was milk and I predicted it was rice. So, so <laughs> And actually, age three now, he's back on to that fine. So um, they, it, it does resolve with time. So the commonest culprit foods are milk, soya, rice, oats and proats, poultry, 50% resolved by 18 months, 90% by 36 months. Okay, I'm just going to very briefly talk about ESM. I know we don't have a lot of time, but again, just to highlight that it presents in different ways of different ages. Um, and those are the symptoms you'd look for. When I endoscope these kids, this is what I see. Now, I realise we don't probably have any other gastroenterologists in the audience, so that's what normal looks like. So. It is thickened, it's furrowed, it's, when you biopsy it, you have to tug, you know, it's, it's fibrous um, and you often have little white dots over it like this. Um, it's defined as a chronic immune mediated esophageal disease, characterised clinically by symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction and an ESN of predominant inflammation. We diagnose it by taking biopsies from three different places in the esophagus and we should have more than 15 eosinophils per high field in at least two of those places. Um, it's a difficult condition to explain to families. It's probably wrong, but I talk about the fact, I tell the families it's like a contact dermatitis in, in the esophagus and a rash, because actually they can see the pictures and that means something to them. This is why I wanted to talk to you about it just briefly today, to say that if you look at the length of delay in diagnosis for age, as people get older, we're quicker at diagnosing it. When we diagnose children, or young adults, they've often had symptoms for 10 to 20 years prior to the diagnosis. So we're very late in diagnosing it in, in young people. We miss it. And why is that important? Because if you don't pick this up, there is a progressive fibrosis of the esophagus, um, an increase in symptoms, but progressive fibrosis, which might need dilatation of strictures. Again, I wanted to flag it up to this audience because it is increasing in, in frequency. But actually, it's seen almost always with an allergic history. So in your allergy clinics, you will have lots, probably, of children with eosinophilic esophagitis. And unless you ask the right questions and get a gastroenterologist involved to look down with an endoscope, you're not going to pick it up. And this was quite useful. So in children, taking a clinic full of children with food-induced anaphylaxis, 5.7 well, 5.7 to 24% of those food-induced anaphylaxis children in that clinic, actually when they looked, had EOE. So it is there much more frequently than you're probably realising. So, um, take-home messages. 
you need to consider the diagnosis. And unless you consider it and ask an allergy focused history, you're not going to pick it up. But please remember that not all reactions to food are allergic. Um, the links to specific foods, either with a food diary or clinically, are difficult because it could be two to twenty two 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 up to two hours to two days after having the food that you actually get the symptoms. Diagnostic tests are negative or unhelpful. The only way of diagnosing is to take the food out and see if the symptoms come back when you reintroduce it. Top five foods are milk, soy, wheat, egg, and fish. So food protein induced proctocolitis is easy, really. <laughs> it's very straightforward. Your symptoms will get better within days of, of taking the, the culprit protein out there. It always, they always grow out of it. It's a mild scenario. The food protein induced gastroesophageal reflux or dysmotility, um, please don't treat uncomplicated because then you just get into a real mire of difficulties. But in complicated, please consider food allergy urgently, urgently. And the IMAC guidelines are absolutely excellent, as I say, in secondary care as well as in primary care. In the food dysmotility, an older child with really difficult symptoms, you need to send them through to somebody who's got really an interest in that area to try and unpick it so we don't start taking foods out sequentially. That's going to be a paediatrician with an interest, a paediatric allergist or a paediatric gastroenterologist with an interest. f pies is rare. It's easily missed, but you should consider it if they've got short-lived severe events. And what I want to say to this audience about EOE is that it's nearly always an otherwise allergic children. It has different <coughs> symptoms at different age. It can only be diagnosed by an endoscopy, and that's when you need a gastroenterologist. Thank you.